Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarin Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. Uruguay, then New Jersey, then Westchester, a little bit Connecticut, and back to Westchester and New York City finally. That's the history of a family who came over here in 1977, correct? That's correct. And I have Robert Wise, the president and CEO of RPW Group, and his son, Andrew Wise, who's the executive vice president of the RPW Group. So tell us the story about your, your grandmother one day saying, we got to leave Bialystok and go to Uruguay. So my grandparents live in the city of Bialystok in Poland, which uh, I would say was not paradise for the Jews at the time. Their life was very miserable. And uh, she decided that it was time to go. This was late 20s, and Hitler had started to take take really a uh, foothold in Germany and, um, and the discrimination in Poland had gotten to a point that life was very difficult. So she said, let's leave. And she did some research at the time and uh, found a place that was accepting Jews. The, uh, the plan was that my grandfather was gonna go first. And the reason why she got the family together was to get help from uncles and cousins and uh, to pay for the trip. So my grandfather, that was a scribe in, uh, in Poland. He, he used to write the prayers that go in the mezuzahs. Uh, so he was going to leave to Uruguay and then find a place, get settled, and bring the rest of the family, which was my grandmother, my father, and his older brother. So my grandfather left, and, um, and then months went by, and they never heard from him. And uh, so they got very concerned. My grandmother gets the family together, gets the ticket, and she travels from Poland to Uruguay with the two kids, which was a two-month trip. It was a train, and, uh, and then eventually get to Italy to get a sh on a ship, and then, and then was a month trip from Italy to Uruguay. And she, founds, she finds my uh, grandfather in Uruguay that uh, didn't spoke only Yiddish and uh, had a lot of difficulties and he was just not being able to put things together. He had no profession that he could make a living out of. So she put the family in order. What year is uh, this they arrived? 1928. Were there many Jews in Uruguay? At this there time? were a few Jews. There were uh, eventually Uruguay that has a population of three million people had 
15,000 Jews at one point or another. My grandfather started to, he learned how to rebuild mattresses. And uh, talking about almost a century ago, people used to go with uh, uh, horse and buggies and go to the homes, take the mattresses and get the wool in the mattress back in order before, when it became really almost like a piece of wood. That was what he did and my grandmother became a seamstress. And then my, my father, as a young kid, started to work in a, in a furniture factory, really as a helper. With his brother also? With his brother also. But then let's talk about the story about since they needed to earn a living with the uh, going to the flea market. The easiest job that a young kid, I think, my father was probably nine or ten at the time, was to help selling hams and sausages in, a, in the flea market. Now, this for a very traditional orthodox family that kept kosher was really a little bit of a problem, but uh, it was very clear that that was work, and you come home and you take a shower and, uh, and you pray, and now you're gonna have a kosher dinner. So. The two things stay separate, and, um, and it worked. And, uh, Tell me about your mother's family. My mother's family came from Hungary. And uh, in both cases, my grandfather had, had 11 siblings. He fought during the Austro-Hungarian Empire during the First War. And uh, when he came back, to Hungary, he was the only one out of 11 siblings that uh, survived. He met my grandmother and moved to Uruguay. And uh, my mother was born when they came to Uruguay, was born. And there. what did your grandfather on your mother's side do? He used to also be in the furniture business. He was more doing the finishing and the, the old fashioned uh, French style finish to furniture. Let's to talk life. about after high school with you. You were in Uruguay and you had to change, you had to go to Brazil. When I graduated high school, I started college in Uruguay. Uruguay went through a little bit of turmoil at the time. There was a group called Tupamaros that were the urban guerrillas of the time. And um, so, the, the schools were closed, and I, I went to Brazil, uh, to Sao Paulo. I spent four years in uh, college there. Studying business. And, uh, studying, yeah, I majored in business. When I graduated, I had it already planned that immediately after I was coming to New York. Had you ever been to the U.S. when you were younger? No, never, never. Did you have any family here? No, not really. So at this time, with $3,000 in your pocket, okay, you come to the city and you end up at 92nd Street, why? I was at Riverside for a period of just months and then 92nd Street, why? And at this time you didn't really speak English too well. That's correct. So then you, you did a couple of things. You went to a course to learn English at night? At the time, the easiest way to come was to study, to enroll in an English course here. I, I enrolled at Columbia University and, um, for a six-month program to learn English as a foreigner. And um, I, I have the distinction of being the only student in the group of 50 that never finished the course. So uh, I never graduated <laughs> technically, and, uh, but because during the time I was really working. Right. So. Now, you got yourself a map, I remember. I was living in Manhattan, and I, I just didn't know anything about Manhattan, so I used to walk miles, and, uh, and I, got, I got myself a map just to understand where so Brooklyn how, how was you, and so Queens was. So how do you become a furniture salesman? I know that the family was in the furniture business. Uh, my father had the factory in Uruguay, and he tried to export benches to the states. So he manufactured 500 benches and sent it to somebody in consignment in New York. And those benches were never touched. So uh, the agreement I had with him was that he, I will become the one that will receive the consignment 
and try to sell them. And with that, I was going to most likely start a business, which is what I did. Right. So let's talk about from that how you got into the real estate business. So I mean, the, you had the first warehouse in Jamaica, in, in Jer Jersey in, City. In Jersey City. Right, Jersey and then City. Jamaica. But I, then I had a small warehouse in Jamaica. Those were warehouses I was renting. And um, eventually, m the business with Uruguay did not work out. But I, I started assembling and upholstering, and, and I learned a few of the trades. Right, you were upholstering chairs. And I was upholstering chair. chairs, exactly. And, uh, and the business took off. And uh, so to make a long story short, uh, within three years, we had a production of several hundred chairs a day. And you needed and, uh, a warehouse. I needed a warehouse. I started looking, and I eventually bought a building in Weehawken, New Jersey, that uh, it was a company that had gone bankrupt. The building was 30,000 square feet. I only needed 10, but it but was a good buy. Right. It was the broker who basically said to you, kid, buy the building, right? Yeah, I, was, I was looking. I was in my 20s. I answered an ad. A broker called me and said, yeah, I have the building for sale. He said, what? he asked me what I did. I explained. He said, this building will work fine. So he told me, just meet me at a parking lot that's not far from the building. Let's meet in the parking lot. We'll drive together. So I come over and... He said, well, won't you follow me? He said, fine, I'll, I'll be happy to do that, but can you tell me what are we going to see specifically? So, so well, it's a 30,000 square foot building that uh, I think would be a perfect furniture warehouse and uh, good for shipping and all this. So I look at him, I said, listen, with all due respect, I, I have a lot of shares to make today and I can't afford 10,000 feet. How can I afford 30,000 feet? So he asked me, how old are you? I said, I'm, I'm 26. So he said, I have grandchildren older than you are. Shut up and follow me. When somebody tells you that and you're 26, you shut up and you drive. So, so it was good advice. And it was probably one of the best advices I ever had. Then there's another warehouse later on, right? That was the first one I bought. And... Um, I move in, I lease 20,000 feet, I use 10, and then somebody came over and, and wanted the 10 I was using. Right, and you leased it. And, you and I leased it, and, uh, but he only needed the space six months later. So within six months, I bought a second warehouse. Okay, so it's 1980, I think, right? 1980, that's right. Okay, 1980, you start the business, right? The, the RPW. Uh, RPW started in 1980. Right. Uh, initially, you were in New Jersey, and you even had a retail site where you had a strip center. The first really big involvement possibly took place was how do you meet your wife? And then because your wife has an influence on Westchester. That's right. Which has an influence on Andrew and your daughter. I did approximately 20 projects in New Jersey, and um, mostly combination of uh, industrial and uh, some retail and and uh, then in 1985, I got married. In 1986, we moved to Westchester. And um, that was the direct result of my wife saying, we are moving to Westchester. So even though all my business was in New Jersey. So we did that. And then, um, and then I started looking for properties in Westchester. So I New ended Rochelle. up. Uh, the, the first building I bought was in, in uh, Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon, nice. In Mount Vernon, and um, I met a wonderful person. The mayor at the time was Ronald Blackwood, and uh, he was a terrific, terrific guy. He did a great job for the city, and, and he, he was stuck with this building that had gone vacant. It was an old high school, and, um, and I bought it. I renovated it and uh, brought it back to life after 40 years of being vacant. And, um, and that, was, that was since uh, 80, 86, 87. When was the RKO Theater? RKO was soon after. I did two RKOs, one in, in Mount Vernon and one in New Rochelle. And um, in both cases, we just kept the structure, dem demolished the interior and rebuilt the building inside completely. 
and uh, one became a school, the school still there in, in New Rochelle after, I don't know, 20 years. The other one in Mount Vernon became an office building with retail and still very active. We don't own them for So a when did time. you buy your first big building in Westchester? Well, the because Westchester had these huge corporate headquarters which were created in the 60s and the 70s where people were moving out to the suburbs. And right. you, you took over some of these properties, you know, one which your, your son said to you was like a spaceship, the craft food facility. Right. So when did you start acquiring major office buildings? The, in the late 90s, I started buying office buildings. Uh, some were larger than others. Uh, 100 and 150,000 square foot was the average size of the buildings. Several in White Plains, Briarcliff, and other towns. But then, then in 2004, we bought the old General Foods building, which is cover is a million square feet. That's what the one Andrew and my daughter called the the Star Trek. Right, and that's the one that you're working on right now, with the uh, the residential. Well, the next generation is yeah, pushing that. Yeah. Well, when we bought the building, it came with additional land. We are using the additional land besides the build. It was a million, building. a million square foot building? The building is a million cover, yeah. And it was completely vacant. It was completely vacant. Well, now, it, was, it wasn't, it was sold as, as a vacant as building. As a vacant building. Now, at, at this time, you had Andrew and Alexandria, right? That's right. And over there, the comment was, could we afford this? Well, this was my wife. When I, I, I have never bought a building that my wife has not looked at at one point or another. And, um, so she's the credit committee. She makes the, yeah, she, the, the investment she's, committee. She's the investment committee. She, he has to pass this mail test for her. And um, so when we came to look at this building, which is majestic, and, uh, and I said, I'm thinking of buying this. So her question was, if it doesn't work out, can we still live at home? So I lied to her and I said yes. And, um, and we're still at home. How old are you at this time? This is 2000. I was, uh, I was a freshman in high school. And I remember when this was all happening, it was a big topic of conversation. But that was a pinnacle moment in the RPW group. I think that was really a turning point for us, that, that particular building which is still our headquarters today. Let's talk about some of the other properties and then we're gonna focus a little bit on what you, you're doing today. You bought the IBM headquarters also. That's right. We bought the 1133 Westchester Avenue, which is uh, 650,000 square feet on, on 80 acres. And um, we bought uh, what was City, City Bank building on Mamaroneck Avenue, on Bank of New York headquarters for Westchester. We bought um, 120 Bloomingdale Road that, uh, that was also corporate headquarters and, and a number of others. Now. Right, now the IBM headquarters is the one right now where you have the Hospital for Special Surgery. That's right. And other, other leading tenants over there. That's right. So let, let's, let's talk about, you have, you have an older sister Who's Correct. 29? She is uh, oh, well, she's 30, 32, 32, 32, 32 years old. When you were, okay. So tell me about growing up in a real estate family. Yeah, I mean, as long as I can remember, real estate was, was part of the day-to-day. -day. Especially since I heard that your mother was the, the investment committee that she had to have the smell. <laughs> yeah, dinners were, uh, were lively, a lot of conversation about real estate. Um, I mean, growing up, I had, I had great memories of going to the office at that point when I was a little kid. It was in Mount Vernon at, at the, the high school that Robert mentioned. Um, running the halls in the office, that was for me a thrill. Uh, but real estate was always part of our life. Weekends we spent going to job sites, checking out potential future projects. Um, and for me, it was, it was always something that I gravitated to. Um, and it's just something that I was exposed and to. And how about your sister? I think she, she, was, she came along. Um, she was there. We, we did, we, a lot of it was done as a family on the weekends. And then in the summer, we would work together in the office, answering the phones as you know, an eight-year-old. Um, so she was very much, we were both very much entrenched uh, in the business. Now, 
you were saying to me that you, could, you loved your father, he was your mentor and everything, but you couldn't work with him. It was the, the wrong chemistry. For whatever reason, we, we just triggered each other. It, wasn't, uh, it was not a good experience for either one of us. I think it was always my father's dream that I would work with him. But uh, I tried during the summers while I was going to college. In my mind, it was crystal clear that that was not going to happen. And was it your dream that your son would work with you? Yeah, the answer is, frankly, that, uh, that the business, the way I always look at this was that it was a family business. I run the business, but this is the family business. And it, it was always open to them with the clear understanding that in either case, Andrew and Alexandra, that, that if they ever wanted to come to the business, they first had to go out and work five years somewhere else, doing whatever they want. And, and after that, it had to be come an agreement that they will want to come and I will want them to come. So, so that's what really happened. So when you went, you went to Hackley. Correct. Okay. So when you were at Hackley, were many of your classmates in the real estate business or in the finance business? Their families? Um, there was a little bit of real estate, quite a bit of finance, um, not not too much real estate. Um, but uh, I, I was, in, you know, in the summers in high school, I worked, I interned at Cushman and Wakefield. Um, so I, I had some sort of more formal exposure. Um, and that continued through college. So how did you decide to go to Trinity? So I played, I was a, a very avid squash player. Um, and uh, Trinity has uh, an interesting fact. They, they have the longest collegiate win streak in any sport, and that's squash. They, won, they went 13 years without ever losing a single match. And, and you were a four-time winner also. So right? I, while I was there, I was a four-time national champion, and uh, I had a lot of friends through squash that went there. It was a very natural fit, and you know, I got to play on the, the best team in the country. So under the five-year apprenticeship program that you said, okay, Andrew was working for Cushman and Wakefield first, and then Newmark. But what Andrew did to the business, slightly changed, is that you came to New York City. You always looked at New York City. You had an involvement, but you didn't acquire. How did you decide to buy the Mary McFadden building on 35th Street? Frankly, uh, Andrew had a very, very important input in that decision. It's very hard to penetrate a market, especially when you are running a business, a family business like ours, where you don't have outside investors, your, your capital is limited. So you, you can't afford to make a mistake. And, uh, and entering a new market is definitely a very risky proposition. So Andrew working at Cushman and Newmark knew the market and, uh, and could tell me things that when we bought the Mary McFadden building, uh, there was, my, my opinion was very consistent throughout. There was nothing I liked. I thought the neighborhood was very difficult. I thought the building was not ideal. I didn't, it was a much smaller building than the ones we own. It was 160,000 feet. The average size of our buildings are over 300,000 feet. We thought it was, I, I thought it was going to be difficult. His approach was, I'm very confident. He gave me the reasons. And, um, and, and you did it. well. Then you bought two, extremely well. Then you bought 275 Madison Avenue. And the, the same experience with 275, yes. Right, so now vacant land, available land. How do you decide to get into the residential business, Andrew? Well, as part of my joining the business, Robert and I spent a lot of time prior to my joining sort of discussing and hashing out the plan and, and very, being very clear about um, responsibilities, et cetera. And one of those things that we both agreed on was, you know, we want to take the time to look at continuing to do what we're doing, which is really value add office opportunities, but looking to see if we can diversify in some way. And one of those things was residential. Um, so as soon as I joined, um, pretty soon thereafter, we, we, uh, we took uh, some land that we had at 1133 Westchester, um, and we were able to, to find a, an excellent partner uh, and move forward on a subdivision of the property, and now, which will be in a couple, couple months, uh, uh, breaking ground on a 300-unit uh, right. residential it's like development. five stories. Uh, five correct. Stories. Three, in, three, in a cluster. 
three buildings, each 100 units. Right. Now, is there a second building that you're doing, a second development? We're in, uh, we're in the entitlement process at 800 Westchester, a piece of land that we acquired with, with the building, um, to build 200 units on, on that site. Tell me about, your, you're married, right? You met Correct. your wife? I met my wife um, at Trinity. She's originally from Boston. And we've been, we were married in June of uh, 2018. And we live up on the uh, Upper West Side. And tell me about your sister. So she worked, uh, she, she worked in the business for a period of time, but her true calling, um, I think, is more the psychology route. Um, so she, she became a life coach. Um, and she's very much enjoying. I mean, your sister's that. an attorney. Okay. Correct. She was an attorney. Um, she worked at one of the leading law firms here in the city for for about two years, and then she came in and joined the business um, for a period of time. But really, I think it was through those experiences was able to find her way towards her her true true calling. So it's interesting. Thank God that your grandmother, the matriarch of the family, said it was time to leave. Poland and come to Uruguay and it's been an interesting travel and it's only going to get more interesting with your son in the business and I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you Michael. Thank you.